Welcome to the Deschutes Public Library on the program. I'm Laura Westendorf, part of the Community Relations team, and today's presentation is Ben's Fire History with Dave Howe. Dave Howe came to Oregon in 1970 after attending college in Ohio and eight years later joined the Ben Fire Department, where he worked for 42 years, promoting through the ranks to battalion chief. In that time, he has responded to thousands of structure fires, wildland fires, hazmat incidences, motor vehicle accidents, and emergency medical calls. In the last six years of his career, he was the public information officer for Ben Fire and Rescue. Dave lives in Old Town Bend now. Thank you for joining us and sharing our local fire history, Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Howe, and I am going to be giving a presentation today on a discussion of some of the notable points in Ben's fire history, the interplay of natural forces, the land, and the people who live here. And uh, as a little bit of a bio, um, Sorry about that. Uh, I recently retired as a battalion chief from the Ben Fire Department after working for 42 years, as Lauren Laurel said. Um, I started in 1978, and I hasten to add that I'm a firefighter, not a historian. Um, I want to make sure this is as accurate as possible, um, but a lot of the information that I have gleaned and that I've put up here as a presentation basically is um, anecdotal uh information from old timers and you know just from hanging around the fire department for so long um to be a good firefighter you have to be a student of your community you have to really have the best interests of the people who live there at heart understand and appreciate the past and the ways of the area also um i listen to the old timers i think it's really important that uh that young firefighters you know don't come in too full of themselves. Listen to the guys that have been there for a long time. I worked with people who were 30, 35 years older than me who had responded to many historical fires who had just lived the, the job and lived the community. And that made a huge mark on me. It made a huge difference in my career. And I was just eternally grateful to the gentleman that came before me. He kind of built the foundation under which, on which I stood. So uh, we'll just jump right into this presentation way, way back. Um, ben Fire Department actually started very early in the history of the city, in the early 1900s. And we always think that, well, it started when we had the fire station built in 1919. Well, that's not true. They had a fire station back in, uh, or a fire department, I should say, back in like 1905, I think is when they started. Um, the chief was, his name was S.C. Caldwell. A lot of times they went by the first two initials. Uh, and uh, Chief Caldwell did not have a fire station. It was all volunteers. Equipment was cached in locations all over town. So where, whenever there was a fire, which I think was fairly frequently, uh, volunteers would run to the closest equipment cache and get what they needed and uh, go to the fire. They didn't actually have the equipment that you see in that slide. They didn't have steam pumpers and horses. It's a very romantic vision. I, I would have loved to have worked with the horses, but um, I was born too late. So uh, we're going to move on with band. And so before 1919, which is kind of like the, you know, the cutoff date, um, Bend was and has been for a long time a mill town, and with mills come fires. And this photograph shows a, uh, the Bend Lumber Company, which was located on the west side of the Deschutes River, north of Columbia Park, and it ran all the way up to Galveston. So it was a pretty good sized mill. All that area that is now residential used to be a gigantic mill. And they cut the lumber for the first Brooks Scanlon and Chevlin Hickson buildings um, that were slated to actually be up in operation by 1915. And interestingly enough, uh, the Ben Lumber Company burned to the ground in August of 1915. So they had cut the lumber they needed for the mill, other mills. Um, and then they burnt down and it was a big fire. It was a huge fire, but they had lots of fires back then. You know, that, there are actually very many small mills all over town. A friend of mine told me there was a mill at the 14th in, in Hartford. And it was a small, these are small mills. They, they came in they cut timber, they either burnt down, they ran out of trees, or they were bought up by larger mills. The larger mills had their own fire brigades, and these, they handled all the small fires that popped up, you know, most likely on a daily basis. In fact, when I was 
a, uh, a firefighter on the line way back. Um, we'd go to mill fires and we, I found out that they had many, many fires that they never called us for. They had fire uh, brigades and we actually trained their fire brigades. Some of their people in the fire brigades were also our volunteers. Um, so they didn't call us for every fire. And that was probably true all the way back uh, the very beginning. But here's, I wanna show you a picture of a, a mill site. Um, this is an old mill site in an undisclosed area located near Bend. I won't say where. Um, the mill actually burnt down in 1919, right not long after Bend received its first fire engine. It took, they, you know, somebody had to run and, uh, and find a way to, to notify the fire department. Of course, they didn't have 911 back in those days. It took 45 minutes for the new engine to arrive. And of course, by that time, the mill was pretty much burnt to the ground. Um, as our, one of our old fire chiefs used to say, they got there just in time to watch the last wall fall in. Um, but so the site is still there and it's kind of neat to be able to see um, kind of the location of well, where the mills used to be. So back in those days, people built almost all the buildings out of wood. Of course, they obviously built some stone brick buildings, but you know, wood was cheap and available to everybody. Um, wood is fuel. Uh, fire sees anything that's made of wood as just basically something to, to burn. So there were a lot of fires back in those days. And, um, and in 1919, as kind of a result of that, the city commission, it was called a city commission back then, decided that Ben needed a 24 hour fire department. So they formed a committee, they appointed a, a tailor from the city of Portland as fire chief. And he, he, they built a fire station at Minnesota and Lava that's still there. It's now called the Brick House, it's a restaurant. And they bought an American LaFrance gas powered engine. That was the first engine. And interestingly enough, we were able to re-procure that engine a few years ago. We have it in our storage. Um, it needs to be restored, but it's actually in pretty decent shape. So it's really cool. The Ben Fire Department has the very first engine that was purchased here over a hundred years ago. So the Portland tailor, his name is Tom Carlin. He was chief for over 20 years actually made all the uniforms for the Portland Fire Bureau and then um, he moved to Bend uh, and he made all the department uniforms. He always wore his, his very uh, formal uniform in all the photographs I've ever seen of him. And um, you can see a lot of photographs of him and everyone has him in that and all the guys have their what they call class A uniforms on. And this was really the, the 1919 was really ushering in of the modern era of fire protection and band. It's pretty, pretty neat time. I think um, they had a, a, initially the station was really fairly small and had two bays had the living quarters upstairs because people may not know, but the firefighters actually live in the fire station. They, when they come to work, they work for 24 hours. Now our firefighters work for 48 hours now. So they have, a, have to have a place to sleep and basically to live, and then they go home and they're off for a period of time. Um, so here's a, pi a picture of the whole fire department back in the day, probably in the, probably in the late 20s. Uh, everybody had spiffy Class A uniforms, and Chief Carlin is just to the right of the front tire on the Chief's buggy, which is the car that the Chief always drove to fire. So they called it the Chief's buggy. Okay, so. Um, Bend was a town in the middle of the woods. And I want to tell you for, for right off the bat, this is not a, um, a scene, it's not a, a fire that happened in Bend. This actually happened in, um, in Idaho, but it was the year 1910. It was a really bad year for wildfire. Um, it was really hot, really dry. And August 20th and 21st, three million acres in Washington, Idaho and Montana burned. It was one gigantic fire. Uh, the Forest Service was very, very close to just had just been basically born and a lot of people were kind of hoping that this would be the demise of the Forest Service but actually they did a great job in trying to contain this thing and keep it from burning down you know even more acres and as a result the Forest Service got um, their budget doubled and they kind of went on from there they are the the go-to agency for wildland firefighting um, Central Oregon, this of course that was not in Central Oregon, but uh, Central Oregon 
had the same climatic conditions and so also had some large fires at the same time period in 1910. The Shoots uh, National Forest fires are typically uh, a one big day event where it gets going, you know, one in the afternoon or whatever. It usually runs from north to south. They're usually wind driven and they usually cool, usually cools down around seven or eight at night and the uh, firefighters are able to uh, what they call hook it or stop the fire or keep it from spreading any farther. But we're going to come back to the wildland fires in just a bit, um, but I wanted to um, talk a little bit about some other kinds of fires. And one of them is, of course, we live in not the middle of the desert, but the edge of the desert. And it's, we only get about 11 and a half inches of, of uh, precipitation per year, most of that in the winter. And so the woods burn, but so does the sagebrush, the tall grass, and the bitter brush. And we've had, but our main focus of fires are in the spring, summer, and fall are brush fires. Um, a brush, we, you know, there's a picture of Pilot Butte right there way, way back in the day, probably about 1905 or so. And um, we, people laugh about, oh, you know, every year we have the fireworks and let's just take bets on how, you know, when the, uh, when the, Butte's gonna burn, ha ha ha. But actually, it is kind of a dangerous situation. It puts people up on the top at great danger. Pilot Butte's burned many, many times. Uh, this fire that I have on the right side of the screen is actually from the 1950s. And you can see that stuff burns pretty fer ferociously. Uh, once a juniper tree catches on fire, it essentially explodes and um, it spreads embers everywhere. So uh, I just kind of want you to keep that in the back of your mind for later on in the slideshow. We have, we have a lot of different kinds of fires here. We have uh, mill towns have mill fires. Residential towns have house fires. Communities in the wildland have fires in the woods that easily encroach on the built environment. And so, excuse me, so uh, we in band have all of those kinds of fires. Um, the various arenas of human activity each present the firefighters with different challenges which is what makes it such an interesting job. So a little bit of a chronology, and I, I really uh, want to apologize right up front because I do not have enough awesome photographs from uh, the earlier days. And um, I got the photographs that I could. Um, I scrounged around. I know there's plenty of others out there, so I'm not able to get a hold of them. But I did want to show you this one. This is from the 20s. I don't know what the fire was. You can see that, um, the way they fought fire back in those days was really uh, everybody chip in. Um, many hands make light work. And uh, <laughs> some people in this picture are working harder than others, um, but everybody wanted to be a part of it. And it was really quite a community effort to put out fires. They had no protective gear, they had very little equipment. Uh, that hose that they're um, pushing into the fire is two and a half inch in diameter when it's full of water and it's super heavy and um, that stuff was pretty brittle pretty hard to move around and, uh, not very flexible so it took a lot of strength and or a lot of people either one so i just wanted to point that out and um we'll go into the 30s because again apologies for no decent photographs um tom carlin was still the chief uh, it was the Depression era. Um, the gear they had was still rudimentary. Uh, in fact, some of the hose that I used in the 1970s was actually placed in service in the 30s. So I used some of the ho same hose as those old timers back then. I will also say, just as kind of an aside and a personal note, that I lived in a house on Georgia and Chamberlain that uh, the, uh, the site of the house uh, the house, previous house, I should say, uh, was blown up by a stick of dynamite in 1940. So we're close to the 30s there, and um, and was rebuilt subsequently. And that's the house I lived in for a long time. But I did at one time have a picture of Chief Carlin standing in front of the blown up house. Um, uh, with his chief's buggy <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a neat neat photograph and in fact uh, the house was uh, blown up by a guy who put a stick of dynamite in the wood stove so my kids when they were little were digging around outside in the yard and found actually found pieces of wood stove which is pretty amazing so they were a little um, young archaeologists 
Okay, so the next, we're going to go right into the 40s, which was a pretty active um, fire decade. It was kind of, we still had a lot of fires. Everything was still made of a lot of wood. Uh, we did not have any, really any fire prevention, particularly. Uh, they didn't have a fire marshal, and they basically, um, you know, responded, or reacted to fires. Um, after they came in, they didn't really um, do a whole lot to prevent them. Um, I got to know a couple of the guys, retired guys, who started in the 1940s. And in fact, uh, well, at least one of them has, was working on this particular fire, which is the Ben Derry fire on July 19th, 1947. Um, it was, uh, it's on Greenwood and Harriman, and you might know it now as the roller rink or the domino room, or uh, it, uh, its building still stands, but it was a big fire. Um, this fire uh, pretty much brought out all hands. I'll show you a couple more pictures of this fire because it was a significant fire downtown. One of bigger, Ben's bigger downtown fires, um, again, just two years after the war, um, you know, Ben was kind of rebounding from the war effort, and you know, there was a lot of community spirit um, some of the old firefighters still talked about this fire in the 70s, which I thought was pretty amazing. Look at the, uh, you can see the humongous piles of wood stacked up around the building. Uh, presumably it's firewood, but that's a lot of fuel. That's to me, or to, I should say, to a fire, that just looks like more fuel. Um, and also look at the crowd of onlookers in the background. It's kind of interesting to see. One more picture of this fire. Uh, you can see that. Um, uh, everybody, it didn't matter if they had any protective gear or not. They just went and they helped out. Um, ben has a lot of stone buildings. And the only existing wooden structure in the actual core area is the Smith Hardware Building on Wall Street, which is actually owned by the Deschutes County Historic Museum. Um, in the early days, most of the buildings were wood, but they found out pretty quick that stone and brick lasted a lot longer and didn't burn. Uh, one of the things that is a humongous concern for the modern Bend Fire and Rescue is downtown fires. Um, we've had a lot of downtown fires. We haven't had as many as some cities, but we're always, always been very concerned about downtown fires. Uh, the O'Kane Building fire, uh, the original O'Kane Building was built before the current one down on Bond in Oregon. Uh, original O'Kane building burned, and that spurred the actual development of the fire department. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Weddell's Skyline Steakhouse and some other fires that happened downtown, but I don't want to say that just last January, we had an apartment fire on Brooks Alley, and that was the last fire that I responded to before I retired. So we still do have downtown fires, and they're very, uh, very much a concern to the fire department. So let's see, oops, I went too far, sorry about that. Okay, so we're gonna go to another fire in the 1940s, uh, July 4th, 1948. By this time, Tom Carlin had passed away at a heart attack um, in I think 42 or 43, and a gentleman named Leroy Fox was the fire chief. Um, and this building was actually, the, the original building you can see on the left, um, was a car dealership and then a guy named Eddie Williamson bought it. He was a longtime Bend businessman, ranch owner and car dealer and kind of a wheeler dealer kind of guy, real character. I, I actually met him, he chatted with me for a while. And, um, and Eddie's building burned down in 1948 and he told me the thing that he, that, that stands out in my mind is he said, you know, Chief Fox was over on, he was completely overwhelmed. It's a huge fire, big building. He was completely overwhelmed. He was standing on the corner of Bond and Greenwood in tears. And Eddie, of course, told me that Eddie got a bunch of guys and they went in and put the fire out. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to hear these old stories. Whether that actually happened or not, we don't really know. We'll never know. But anyway, Eddie rebuilt the building and the front of the building still stands as the bank entry for what used to be Bank of the Cascades. I'm not sure what it's called now. So yeah, part of the building is actually still standing. We're gonna move into the 50s, um, which is and getting a little bit closer to the era that I'm familiar with. Um, we had a pretty good influx of people to bend in the 50s. You know, it was post-war, 
people were kind of you know, had started to develop, uh, build families. They were trying to find, you know, meaningful work. Um, Bend was an attractive place. A lot of people moved here. Um, Bend, the mills were, uh, the mill, Brooks Scanlon was, was uh, doing really well. They had bought out Shevlin Hickson uh, in 1950. And interestingly enough, they had agreed to, in the 1930s, they sat down, the two mill uh, management teams sat down and figured out that they were going to run out of trees. And they actually agreed who was going to buy out who. And uh, obviously, Brooks Scanlon uh, bought out Chevlin Hickson in 1950. Uh, but there were other mills in town, too. One of them was owned by a guy named Leonard Lundgren over on East 9th and Wilson on uh, the 14th of March, 1954, it burned down. Um, but if you can see that picture is of the Lundgren mill, um, the gear was getting better. The, they actually had turnouts and helmets and they had decent, you know, they were getting some better hose and they still lost the building. Uh, but they um, uh, were getting a little bit more safer and that's a good thing. Uh, another big fire, this is a little bit earlier, was a uh, June 30th, 1951. This is literally one of the biggest fires Bend has ever seen. I don't know much about it, but I know it was a hot, windy day. Uh, my old captain, Daryl Barber, who was uh, he's a captain when I, when I was hired in 1978, he was working that day, and he remembers uh, that it was, it was an unbelievable fire. It was the biggest fire he'd ever been on. There was plenty of fuel. It was a furniture store, and they built or a finished furniture factory, and they built really heavy, clunky pine furniture. And so there was such a massive amount of fuel in this building. It was over there. I think it was to the north of uh, the old Pilot Beauty Inn. So it's up in that area where uh, River Point is, and that uh, that whole area was a big factory. Um, so this is, you know, this is the 50s, and uh, during the 50s, we got a new fire chief, and this is the son of Tom Carlin, Vern Carlin, and Vern um, would prove to be a transformational leader for this organization. He was the chief from 1952 until 1973. Uh, one of the things he did was, um, there, the city limits was, that was the boundary where the city fire department could operate. They couldn't go legally were not allowed to go fight fires outside the city limits. Uh, but it was heartbreaking for these guys to go to respond to a fire they, they found out about or they got a call and then come to the city boundary and look across the boundary and see how it's burning down. There's nothing they could do about it. And um, this happened one too many times. In 1953, uh, there was a fire, I believe it was in like Aubrey, uh, it was on, on the north of the Aubrey Butte area, and it was just outside the city limits. And uh, they responded, and they stopped at the city line, and Vern said, you know what, this is not acceptable. We can't do this. And so he was instrumental in starting the, the Schutz County Rural Fire Protection District Number 2, which we usually just call the district. The district runs... Um, it's it kind of in uh, it's the per, around the perimeter of the city bend, uh, and it encompasses about 140 square miles. It's a big area. Not that many people lived in it at that time, but it was a big area. It includes Tumalo and includes the area that's uh, now Deschutes River Woods. Um, it's a it's a large area, and um, so that was a really big thing for fire protection in the bend area. The other thing that Vern did was he invested in regional training. Back in those days, there was very little training. You basically come to work and you learn by doing and you figure it out when you get there. And, um, you know, that makes uh, fire ground a pretty dangerous place if nobody knows really what they're really doing. Now, these guys were practical people. So it wasn't like they were a bunch of dummies that just, you know, this race to fires. They, they had a pretty good idea of what to do. Um, but they didn't have a lot of training. So Vern would go to um, yearly training conferences in Washington, come back. And then cool thing was he trained everybody in the whole area. He would go and train sisters firefighters and uh, Redmond firefighters. So, I mean, he was a, a regional thinker, a big thinker. And uh, he was also 
I never worked for him, but I knew him, and he was just an awesome guy. He was a really great guy. He passed away in the 90s, but um, this uh, picture that you see there, the bus, that's Vern, and the bus is uh, was an old Mount Hood Stages bus that would go back and forth from Portland to Bend. It was a really cool bus. I actually got to drive it. Um, it had a, a, a Buick Roadmaster straight eight engine in the back of it. It was lined with mahogany paneling and velvet seats. It was pretty cool for fire for a fire apparatus. In the back of it, we opened it up. Um, that's where we stored all the ladders. And so really, they took this bus and they remodeled it into a fire apparatus with a 45 foot ladder and a bunch of other ladders and a whole bunch of equipment that they stashed in uh, inside and made it into what we call a truck company. So uh, it didn't have a pump or water or anything like that, but it was a uh, had all it was like a giant rolling toolbox. So in the 1950s, we did have um, quite a few uh, downtown fire, well, quite a few significant fires, two significant downtown fires. Um, first one was excuse me, was Weddell's department store down on uh, Wall Street, right about where Minnesota hits Wall. On May 15th of 1962, uh, Weddell's burned, and um, my boss, the, uh, my battalion chief when I was a captain, Ray Gann, he actually uh, responded to and fought that fire. And um, it's kind of a funny little sideline is that Weddell's had the only elevator in town at the time, and uh, the kids in town would run up and down the elevator until they were chased off by the employees. And I, I married a, a local gal here, and I'm pretty sure that she was one of those kids. I think pretty much every kid in Bend would go down and play around in the elevator until they got chased away. About three years later, uh, 1965, Skyline Steakhouse um, burned. The, the Weddells is on the, on the left, as you can see, and the right is the Skyline Steakhouse, just a half a block south of Weddells. Um, and then also Aubrey Hall had a, or Aubrey Hall, excuse me, Aubrey Butte had a big fire in 1964. You can still see the fire scar on the east side of the Butte. We'll, you'll get to see a picture of that in a couple of minutes. Um, the big changes were coming in just a very few years. Uh, and we're talking about like 1970s, 1970. Um, we uh, had some big changes and uh, we started to realize that um, medical, emergency medical situations were going to be the purvey of fire departments. And the way we came about it here at Bend is kind of interesting because the way uh, we had an ambulance, the city had an ambulance and it was parked over at the police department. And the procedure was if there was an ambulance call and usually it was like a motor vehicle accident, rarely did they actually go on medical calls. So they'd go to motor vehicle accidents so what would happen is the police department would get the phone call about the wreck. The closest police officer to the police department would race through town and go get the ambulance. Then he would race from the, from the police department over on Wall Street to the fire department on Minnesota and pick up the firefighter that's standing outside waiting for him. And then they would go to the call. Well, what happened in the early 70s is... Um, Police, there was a wreck right downtown, and the police officer raced right past the wreck to the fire police station, picked up the ambulance, raced past the wreck again, and picked up the firefighter, and finally came back. And that's when the city uh, commission said, "You know what? That is not that's not acceptable." And it was um, uh, a gentleman named Lieutenant Randy Gonyer who actually hired me, um, and he's pictured in that picture with the sunglasses. Um, he and Chief Carlin, Fern Carlin, um, convinced the city commission that the, the ambulance service and EMS needed to be housed within the fire department. And um, it was a really big change. Uh, it really changed not only the community, but really changed the organization. And Randy told me that a lot of the guys, the old time firefighters, just hated him because he brought this to to their workspace and that they had to be a part of it. And they didn't, they never signed up to be fire or to be nurses or EMTs. Uh, and here they were having to, um, to do this. But um, it did, this change forced the Ben Fire Department to develop some strong community-based core values and to become more compassionate, 
and to become more educated. Uh, it's a super big deal for uh, the whole community. So, you know, I really um, I want a, a debt of gratitude we all have to uh, Chief uh, Vern Carlin and L Lieutenant Randy Gonyer for actually making this happen. Uh, it was not easy and it was certainly not personally easy for them. So in, uh, oops, I uh, hit too far. So um, fire prevention actually started to work uh, in, you know, this era in the 1970s, people were going, okay, that, you know, um, uh, okay, we can control some of these fires and we don't have to have as many fires. And we really started to see fire frequency begin to drop in the 80s. In spite of a, a, a rapidly increasing population, we had less and less fires. Uh, we had, we did, however, have more and more brush fires and wildland fires. Um, as time went along and more people moving into the wooded areas. And that was kind of a significant issue that we, um, that we had to deal with when the 80s saw a lot more EMS calls too. So I wanna kind of fast forward to uh, some of the big fires in the 1970s. Um, there was uh, another Bend Dairy fire. This is for the actual dairy farm in Tumalo, and this is again, this was in the rural fire district now. So we had a we had a fire station in Tumalo by this time. So it was probably going to be about in like 1974, 75. Very windy day in I think it was in May or June. Um, one person at the Tumalo station. It was only a one person station, which is really that was the old way of doing things. Um, this was an individual that was happening working that day who never called for help unless it was really, 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 really bad. Uh, and this was really bad. He called for help and he, he was completely overwhelmed. They had a, a big fire spread to all the buildings up there. Uh, it walked away through the brush and they finally got a hold of it. But it was one of those fires that when I got hired, everybody talked about. Um, another fire that I actually responded to was the Bridge Creek Fire in June of 1979. I got hired in January of 78. In June of 79, um, we had, uh, and that the picture on the, on the right there is the Bridge Creek Fire. And this was kind of a wake up call because this was um, a, a fairly small town, still we only had about 20,000 people in town, but a lot of new people were here. And uh, people didn't understand and hadn't seen too many, um, uh, wildland fires. They had been pretty quiet. You know, maybe they have a few, but the guys were able to stop them. But this fire happened up by the water, the city water intake. And um, it was forest fire, bona fide forest fire. And when it happened, it freaked people out. It was a, ended up being about 3,500 acres and it was coming from west to east. It went right over the top of the city water intake on Bridge Creek. We were up there, there's eight of us up there. And actually the, the cops tried to stop me from going up there, even though I was in a fire truck, they tried to stop me. We just kept driving. Um, we got up there, we were wetting down the, uh, all the brush and the trees and we could hear it like a freight train. Uh, the chief came running up, the chief at the time, his name was Pete Hansen, came running up to where me and my other guys were working. He, you know, he said, get out, get out, go, go. And so we jumped on the rig and we drove out he went back to get the other guys and uh, it was too late. They couldn't get out. And so they, four firefighters were um, stood in the creek with, uh, with, a, with a, um, a portable pump running with the nozzles going straight up. And we didn't hear from them for half an hour on the radio. We thought the worst. And for, finally we heard a voice and it was like, oh, you know, thank goodness. We actually, uh, they actually survived that nasty fire. It roared down the Tumalo Creek Canyon, and uh, we were able to make it just, just nudge it just a little bit so it didn't burn the little settlement that's up there. I also wanted to mention very quickly another fire. This is kind of an interesting deal. Uh, I worked on the Forest Service, uh, on a Forest Service crew on the Fort Rock Ranger District in 1976, and uh, before I had got hired, um, my crew that I, had, that I was assigned to had been to a fire called the Overturf Fire, Overturf Butte um, in 1976. And they, uh, they were telling me how hard they worked and how the Ben Fire Department showed up, but the Ben Fire Department didn't do anything. They just kind of sat around and my crew did all the work, blah, blah, blah. 
I said, wow, that's pretty amazing. So uh, I really want to work for the fire department, but boy, I hope they're not lazy. So I got to work for the fire department two years later, and I asked the guys about the overturp fire and how, you know, what was it like working with the foresters? And all the guys in the Bend Fire Department said, oh, these guys are so lazy, they didn't do anything. We, we stood there, we did all the work. So it really is a, kind of a, it's a question of perspective. What side you're on, that's the, who's doing the work. I thought that was pretty funny to, to hear the opposing points of view. Um, one more fire that happened in uh, May of 1979 in the city uh, was the Corpine Fire, sometimes known as, um, as Brooks Willamette. It was a big chipboard mill, and they, it was a huge mill over uh, just south of Arizona, uh, uh, kind of like off of Arizona and Division. And, um, and it's come, you know, the access to it's been taken over by the parkway, and uh, Corpine itself went out of business about maybe 20 years ago, and it was bought by uh, Hooker Creek, but um, interestingly, we had the we had a fire in the their Sada storage building. It was a humongous building, and it was completely on fire when we came around the corner. It was smoke was coming out of every orifice, and it, we just you know we battled it, and we kept it from burning the rest of the mill down, which was a pretty good deal. Uh, what's interesting to me is how the whole in in the, in the 2016 we had the big snowstorm and. The um, you know the those buildings some of those buildings actually collapsed they were being used for storage, and uh, subsequently Hooker Creek came in got rid of all the stuff that was being stored, and completely wiped the slate clean. There's no sign of Corpine at all, even though it provided working class jobs for hundreds and hundreds of families in Bend for decades, and it's completely gone. And there's no sign. There's no tur. Uh, what um, plaque there's no anything that says this was part of our community so i think that was that was kind of sad in a way but significant okay so we're going to move to one more fire that i responded to and this is in the early 80s this is the old stone church uh on uh franklin and uh harriman and uh we came around the corner responding from the station uh, out east on hamby road we we're the first ones there uh it was ripping. It was like this. It was uh, full of smoke. Fire was coming out. And um, we were able to, there was another structure fire, coincidentally, at the same time, just blocks away. Uh, we were I'm very, pretty proud of our efforts. We were able to stop the fire and um, save the church. And we saved all the stained glass windows, which I thought was really cool. The interesting little personal note on this one is that my dad was a minister for 50 years or whatever. And uh, it, said it felt so surreal to drag a hose line into a church and basically spray water at the altar, which is where the fire was. So, um, but that was, that was a significant fire to me. And that building still stands and it's a bike shop now. Cal, I, wanna, um, I want to talk a little bit about the new threat that came up in the 90s. Uh, this is not really a new threat, but it was new to us. Um, August 4th, 1990, about 3.06 p.m. in the afternoon. County Fair was going, uh, a hot and dry day, a little bit of wind out of the north. Perfect day for weather, for fire, for weather for fire spread. And an unstable air mass, very, very low humidity, a little bit of wind, um, and arson fire, we found out later it was arson, um, up by Shevlin Park, just, just above where um, Aspen Hall sits. And um, this was the Aubrey Hall fire, which I think a lot of people have heard about. And um, if you look at this, this uh, picture, by the way, you can see the, on Aubrey Butte there, uh, you can see the big fire scar from 1964. I wanted to mention that. So a couple of things were happening this day. One of them was that most of the people in the Bend Fire Department were on a camping trip on Crescent Lake. So there wasn't a lot of people available. We had our duty crew and a few other people that were still in town. Uh, the Fount County Fair was going, um, and that was up in Redmond. And this fire, uh, the first responding people, uh, first guy that got there went up there and inspected it. it. Was it was burning? It was burning hot, and it was burning rapidly. Uh, battalion chief pulled up behind him, and the individual who the first guy. He basically, he used to work for the Forest Service, so he had a really good understanding. He just basically walked by the, the battalion chief, he walked past him and said, we lost it. And uh, it, was, it was off to the races. This fire started romping and stomping, uh, heading, no, heading south, and um, it burned uh, for 
a day and a half. It was um, Aubrey Hall fire. It was called the Aubrey Hall fire, which is kind of a misnomer. It was actually near Aspen Hall and also um, not too far from Aubrey Butte. So when people heard Aubrey Hall fire over the news radio, people up at the, at the uh, county fair who lived on Aubrey Butte were completely freaked out. They thought that it was, you know, their houses were burning and the whole Butte was on fire. It was not the case. Um, a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, it was a big fire. We tried to stop at it. We couldn't stop it. We'd, we'd, we'd go down to where we think it was going to be, try to stop it at the next road, like Skyliners Road. We'd pinch it down and make it narrow, but it would jump the road. And then we off again, it would go. It's probably about a mile wide fire front um, heading down south. Um, at its widest. Uh, the weather through the night was hot and dry and never got below 90 degrees all night long, which is completely unusual for this area. Um, Oregon Department of Forestry took over the fire and uh, they're the ones that named the fire. And they're the ones that set up a uh, fire camp in at COCC. And when our guys went to go to fire camp to check in and you know, uh, get food and all that. They were kicked out. They weren't allowed to be there because they were not part of the ODF operation. Um, fire jumped the river uh, in the middle of the night. It burned the police chief's house to the ground, interestingly enough. Um, we find It finally ran into a green field early in the morning uh, the next day and we were able to stop it. There were 53 fire agencies that responded under the Conflagration Act which at the time was very rarely invoked by the governor. Now they use it you know, multiple times a year, but I think when they used the Conflagration Act to get uh, Oregon fire agencies to respond, um, it had only been like the third or fourth time in years. Um, so it was really quite a big significant fire and, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but beyond the fact that it was destructive, uh, 3,350 3, 3, acres were burned it ran for six miles from Shevlin Park almost to Deschutes River Woods. And some places is almost a mile wide. And this is, I'll show you a couple of pictures of the aftermath. Uh, it burnt everything. It was hot. Everything was dry. It was maybe six or seven percent humidity. Um, it, was it was ready to burn. Um, 22 houses were destroyed. It was a massive evacuation effort. Uh, and we learned a lot of lessons. And uh, one of the lessons that we learned was we cannot keep doing things the way we were doing things. We uh, were all operating in our own little silos. Um, you know, ODF had their own fire camp. They had their own fire uh, organization structure. Uh, everybody was excluded from everybody else's operation. And it was so uh, dysfunctional that um, it, it, it was bound to fail. And we, after the Aubrey Hall fire, we all got together in different agencies and said, we can't do this anymore. We're going to work together. And now the um, fire agencies in, in Central Oregon, uh, ODF, BLM, Forest Service, and the fire departments are work seamlessly together. And it's because of the Aubrey Hall fire and the lessons that we learned. And so the big test for our, um, our lessons was the skeleton fire in 1996. Um, and this was an 18,000 acre fire in our district. It was 35,000 acres in all. It was a lightning fire that started um, on the 24th of August and it started romping and stomping up through the subdivision called Sundance. And uh, 19 homes were destroyed, but guess what? Nobody got hurt and um, we were able to keep the fire from burning a lot more houses. We worked together really well. And in spite of the fact that it was an extremely large fire and there were plenty of other big fires burning at the same time in the area, um, we felt like we were very successful. And ever since that time, uh, Bend Fire has really uh, been the national, I would say all of Central Oregon's uh, fire agencies have been the national model for interagency co cooperation. So that's kind of the that's kind of like the culmination of all of this history that, that I've been talking about all these years. Is we, yeah, we, we, we had our share of tribulations, but we learned from those and uh, we're pretty happy with the way things have worked. So um, what I want to do is, is kind of, like, you know, let you know that you can stay out of the line of fire. You don't have to be a part of this history in a negative way. Uh, fires see houses as fuel, just like any other fuel model. You can have a stack of firewood, you can have a pile of brush, and you can have a house, and the fire sees it all as fuel. It just burns differently. 
houses um, do not necessarily, the most house, when you have one of those big fires like they do in California, they found that the houses do not ignite from roaring wall of fire or crown fire. That's not how houses burn. Houses burn from the ground fuels that are ignited by embers. So a fire, a wildland fire can be coming up a hill and it's gonna be throwing out tons thousands and thousands of embers. If the fuels ahead of that fire are receptive to ignition, uh, they're going to ignite and then that's going to make the fire continue on. And if the fuel happens to be a house, well, you know, it's going to burn. Once the house burns, it's going to spread embers to the next house. And that's how those things happen. And they've done a lot of studies to, to basically confirm this. A bend is going to have more big fires. So we're a target area. Uh, we have the fuels. We have the climate. We have the, uh, the, the essential elements that will create big fire around here. But we do not have to be victims. We are not helpless. And that's the lesson I kind of want to pass on to everybody is that you can protect your home. You don't have to clear cut your yard. You don't have to cut down every tree, you know, for miles around. What you need to do is recognize the home ignition zone. Five feet from the house, 30 feet from the house, 100 feet from the house. Remember that fuel is whatever can burn. Weather conditions can intensify the burning, but the fuel is the critical element. If you can remove the fuel, you're going to be able to protect your house. And if nothing else, you're going to give the firefighters a fighting chance. To, um, to get in there, to buy those guys some time so they can protect your house. So, you know, uh, if you can cut down the flashy light fuels like that grass in the pictures there, remove lower limbs and the dead materials, um, lower limbs of trees, the dead material, of, you know, brush and dead brush and stuff, just get it out of there. Um, you can see in that right-hand photograph where if the grass fire started, it would easily spread to the fence. It would be easily spread to the tree uh, because there's ladder fuels that go from the ground all the way up. And then it would go right into that house. So this is a setup for a house fire that is spread by a, a, or started by a grass fire. So if you can take care of those things, um, it's going to really, um, really make a difference. Cleaning up all dead materials and nothing that can burn within five feet of the house is really going to help a lot. Um, take the needle cast off of your roof, and I'll be, I'll be bluntly honest and say that that's my roof. I need to go up there and get the needles off of there. Uh, so I put this photograph in there to motivate me to do that. Um, use, if you can use a one eighth inch mesh screen for attic fence, that's going to help keep the embers from coming into the, your attic. Uh, clean the gutters. Um, using non-combustible ground cover like pavers, rock, concrete to create a five foot non-combustible clearance from the house, uh, five feet out from the house. So if you can see that right hand photograph, uh, there's a lot of bark mulch and that's gonna, em at the embers are, gonna, are going to make that smolder and creep along until it gets to the shakes. And then as those shakes are gonna ignite and we're gonna have a house fire. So that's what we're thinking. So if you can think like an ember, you're going to be able to protect your house and protect your, not just protect your house, but protect your whole community. Because if you can protect your house, that's one less source of ignition for your neighbor. Um, so we're talking about a community effort. And I think it's really important um, to, to think that way and, you know, realize that you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting the people around you. And uh, this picture here was, was taken, um, there, people were watching the Aubrey Hall fires in 1990. Uh, they were sitting on their wood shake roof, and to me, it's very ironic because wood shake roofs are uh, like having a gasoline storage on your roof. Um, if you have, if you have a shake roof, save up your money and replace it with something that's non-combustible, um, because that will. That's one of the main ways that fire spreads is through the uh, wood shake roofs. Um, I just want to um, talk very briefly about the Ben Fire Department uh, because I still love that place even though I retired. Uh, the Ben Fire Department has evolved with the times and has played a part in our history. And we really, the, the basic way we look at it is we seek to protect our community from harm by bringing our best to every call. And if you can see, um, we are grounded in an intentional culture. We decided that we would have um, a certain culture, we were going to act and be this way. And um, values really are everything. So if you can see, 
you can you can see our values there. Um, you know, we we really do uh, live by our values, and hopefully you can see those. Um, there's resilience. Oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, uh, yes, um, I'm having a hard time reading them myself. Um, but values are what kind of ground us in our in our uh, operations. And so, um, you know, it's going to be a hot summer out there. Oops, I got one more slide there. This one here. Um, this is who we are, and you are part of us. So it's going to be a hot summer. It's going to be a dry summer, possibly. So um, I hope that you stay cool out there and that you take uh, and that you've enjoyed uh, a little jaunt through the, the decades. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't have more cool photographs, but that's kind of how the Ben Fire Department has evolved. It's kind of how the history of the fire department has has moved. And we hope that uh, we you will not be a part of that history in a bad way, but maybe you can be a part uh, of the history by helping us protect each other. Thank you very much and take care. And I hope to see you guys someday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. That was a great tour de force of our local history of, with fire and the people and organizations that made it happen. I will appreciate a new, the old stone church the next time I drive by in Franklin and yeah. try to think like an ember. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that it caught on fire. That is yeah, so surprising that, to me. <laughs> well, you know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of other fires. I could go, we could talk for like eight hours about all the fires, but you really got to pick out the ones that are, um, you know, the most meaningful, I think, you know, that you can learn mm. something from. Uh, and I'm really sorry I didn't have more photographs from the old days because those are really cool. But, um, and I know we have, you know, we are historic society has some of those pictures. They just don't, they're just still, still working on curating them and, you know, archiving them and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to grab them. But well, so you yeah. will you edit this down? This is about. I mean, I went way longer than I thought I would. Um, no, I think that was perfect. That was great. Um, and I don't know that we need to edit it down. Like I was enthralled the entire time. So um, I think I think we're good. So All right. I don't think well, we cool. need to edit really anything. So I will send you a link as soon as it goes live. Awesome. And yeah. Thank you so yeah, much for doing this and putting this together. It was I'm, sure. I'm I, I was texting my mom. I was like, "You guys have got to watch this when it goes live <laughs> because I grew up here. My dad grew up here, so yeah. Oh, he'll you be, did. He'll be, yeah, and he'll be totally interested. He moved so here is, in the fifties. Did your dad go? Did your dad go to Ben High School? He went to Redmond High. As, as oh, Redmond. Okay. Mm hmm. Well, yeah. Redmond just Redmond just now passed. They passed a levy, the first levy they've ever passed, uh, an operating budget uh, levy, which is exciting for them because Le Redmond is in, they're in dire straits, uh, Redmond Fire, mm -hmm. because they just have no money, and they were able to pass mm -hmm. this levy. I'm I'm so happy for them that they, uh, because Redmond's growing like a Redmond's growing like a weed. It's it's scary. It's, um, yeah, it's, they, yeah. They still have two person engine companies. So, yeah, no. I mean, three person is the minimum standard. Oh, well, they don't have any money. They can't pay wow. for it. So this is going to help them a lot. Mm. And, um, yeah, yeah, they have I mean, grown so much. It's unrecognizable. So I'm like an old person. Yeah. I drive by and I go, that used that field used to be, <laughs> that used to be right. a field. And now it's right. full of houses. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think stuff like this will teach, maybe be helpful for people to think about why it's important, why we are doing this. So. Well, you know, and actually, did you grow up in Redmond? Yeah. So when were you, when were you growing up? What was what years about? I graduated uh, Redmond High in two thousand six. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was a big fire in Redmond in uh, let me think about nineteen eighty five or eighty six. It was a it was like a no 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 no. There was a big fire in nineteen eighty. Twenty five hundred oh. acres out by the airport. I mean, mm. it burned well north of the airport, up closer to the hospital. And it, it, I mean, it just went, it went nuts. And you think, well, how, what, can, what can burn? But it's that grass and, you know, just right. brush and stuff. And it just, yeah, cheatgrass and sagebrush. Yeah. Mm. It was the perfect combination of conditions. And uh, then they had another fire in 1986 that, uh, see, this is long before you were born. This is like, <laughs> I was born in 87. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. 
anyway, they um, it was a fire up in the um, in uh, up by the airport, 100 acres or so. And I remember I was in the office of the fire de- of the Ben Fire Department, and the the old grizzly. I mean, we're talking about an old time grizzly old fire chief from Redmond calls up and he goes, "Send me everything you got." Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Uh, we can't really do that, Chief. Sorry, <laughs> that was kind of the state of affairs. You know, just send them everything. Right. Nobody gets us naked, but you know. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope mm-hmm. you enjoyed it. And I'm sorry I rambled on too long. Um, no, that was it. Was everything you said was really interesting. Thank you for joining us and sharing our local fire history, Dave. <laughs>